Good morning, Year 9! It's your one and only Miss Martin, still in the same outfit from Monday because, psych, this is Monday, but it's going up on Thursday um, for you because I am in school teaching Year 10. Um, so, the plan for this morning's lesson is to go over the events of the Hungarian uprising that we did on Monday, um, and then I will go over and um, do the consequences for you to help you because the plan is that we'll look at the consequences together today um, and then tomorrow's live lesson we'll be looking at a narrative account all right which is a type of question your second type of question that you will wa uh, watch that <laughs> that you will have in your cold war exam it is the easiest it's even easier than the one that we've done before um but we need to do it because you'll have never seen it before and it is unique to the course so Without further ado, let's start. So our story starts in 1953. Stalin dies of a brain aneurysm on the 5th of March. And uh, there is two years of complete infighting in the Communist uh, Party. What I mean by that, there are several different leaders, all vying to be top dog. And eventually, in 1955, Nikita Khrushchev um, comes out, emerges as the new leader of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. The people of the Soviet Union and the satellite states are really happy about this. He's very different to Stalin. Um, and that is revealed in his secret speech, i.e. a speech that is not so secret to the Communist Party. Um, and it talks about de-Stalinisation. Now, de-Stalinisation is literally what it says on the tin. There is no no other way of describing it. It is literally removing Stalin from the policies of the Soviet Union, as well as having some peaceful coexistence with the West and the Western countries, particularly America. Because as we know, Stalin had been antagonising uh, the so uh, no, Soviet Union, they are part of the Soviet Union. Stalin had been antagonising America and America knew what buttons to press in terms of Stalin and how to make him more paranoid. Meanwhile, from World War I to 1955, Hungary had been ruled by a guy called Rakeshi. Rakeshi was a communist that had been put there by Stalin. He was a complete Stalin fanboy. He loved Stalin, loved what he represented, um, and really enjoyed how he had run the country. As a direct result of that, Star uh, Stalin's little fanboy Rakeshi ran Hungary um, very similarly. He was brutal. Um, he would purge his uh, communist party and the people that went against him and arrest them. There was a definite lack of free speech. Um, there was a secret police name, known as the Arvo. Um, and things were, he was, things were very difficult in Hungary. They were very similar to the Soviet Union. And also um, it then meant that he was extremely unpopular. When Khrushchev then comes to power in 1955, in 1956, there are protests in Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, and they rip down Stalin's statue. They go after the Communist Party, and Rakeshi, in order to, um, they, they want Rakeshi, they, they smell blood, they want him. Um, in order to, like, quieten down these protests, Khrushchev, oh, he's over there, Khrushchev appoints a guy called Imre Naj. It looks like the word Nagy, but it's pronounced Naj, okay? Now, Naj is a well-liked communist okay he's um much more liberal in his views they do see him the soviet union as a loyal person because they would never have appointed him else so when he gets into power he starts to kind of test the waters and see how much freedoms that khrushchev is bringing in he's de-stalinizing how far can he go he wants uh, freedom of speech of press of religion of travel he wants to see how far hungary can go and have a little bit more of these freedoms that they enjoyed pre the Nazi invasion. Now, Naj is quite successful in how far he can get those, but he's starting to get those and starting to ask those of Khrushchev and Khrushchev is beginning to relent until Khrushchev then uh, is shocked by the fact that Naj says, I want to leave the Warsaw Pact. If you remember a couple of lessons ago, again, I said this on Monday, um, that the Warsaw Pact, when it was set up, it was compulsory for all 
of the Soviet Union satellite states. There was no choice like there was in NATO. Every single satellite state or the eight states had to join. There was no choice to it. When Naj then says, oh, I want to leave the Warsaw Pact. We don't want to be in it. We didn't want to be in the first place, but we really don't want to be in it now. Khrushchev flips out and he is scared of what we call a domino effect, meaning that if he lets Hungary leave the Warsaw Pact, it is going to let other or inspire other satellite states to leave the Warsaw Pact, meaning the Soviet Union would be left vulnerable. And he just can't have that. He thinks that now she's now basically taking the Michael, which he is. So on the 4th of November 1956, 6,000 Soviet troops and 200,000 uh, tanks and six... Oh, good Lord. Start again. You can tell I'm not editing this. Yes. 6,000 tanks and 200,000 troops um, invade Hungary and they go to squash the uprising. Yes, Fletcher, they do. Fletcher is still down here. Um, and Hungary don't go down without fight. There, are, the rebels do use guerrilla tactics, as I said on Monday. It's not guerrilla, it's guerrilla as in unconventional, unrecognised tactics, i.e., Molotov cocktails and um, setting tanks on fire. Things that you wouldn't do in a war because it's not seen as honourable. Not that any war is honourable, but there you go. On the tenth of November, it is quite apparent that the Hungarian rebels are no match for the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union and Hungary and the UN, I believe, um, agree a ceasefire, meaning that the uh, the kind of invasion and the mini war that they've got stops. There is sporadic fighting, meaning there are little scuffles between the Soviet occupiers and the Hungarian uh, rebels that are left, um, all the way up to the middle of 1957. But on the whole, the uprising is squashed in six days. Now that we've recapped the story of the Hungarian uprising, we need to look at what actually happens as a result, a consequence. Now, reminding you that consequences can be both positive and negative. When it comes to the Hungarian uprising, the majority are negative. You don't always have to have a positive consequence. That is just life. But just keep that in mind. Bear that in mind that there are positive and negative consequences. It just so happens in this story, there isn't. So what actually happens then? So after the ceasefire is agreed, the Soviets are now wanting to get rid of um, Nash. Okay, so Nash is um, is their main target, and they do then replace Nash with a guy called Kadar. Let me write him up for you. Kadar is much more hardline. He is a much stricter guy, um, and he is um, much uh, more of what Khrushchev wants. Okay, he's more of what Khrushchev wants in a leader. He won't stray too far from what Khrushchev wants. He is very loyal and much su more suitable candidate. Now. We know that Yugoslavia wasn't part of the Soviet Union. We've mentioned that very briefly now. Um, Yugoslavia were communists, but they didn't want to enjoy. Uh, they didn't want to join the Soviet Union, so we're like friendly with them, but their own separate country. Nash had been hiding in the Yugoslavian embassy. They'd happy to house him, um, and yeah, so he'd been hiding there. Now, what happens is, is that Kadar offers Naj safe passage to leave the embassy um, and get out of the country. But he actually double crosses Naj. So Naj begins to leave the um, embassy and is actually arrested. He is then put on trial in uh, Romania, I believe, 
Um, he's put on trial in Romania and he's found guilty of treason against the uh, Soviet Union and he is hanged for his crimes in 1958. So they've gone from Hungary, we've had a reformer, a reformer um, leader to now back to a hardline leader and their reformer leader is uh, executed. So what then, what were the consequences? Well, the Soviet troops were obviously very easy to uh, able to defeat the um, Hungarians. Um, and it is done with you know very little loss of life for them. There is only roughly about 7,000 Soviets killed. Okay. Now, in terms then of the rebels, it's much, much more. 20,000 Hungarian rebels are killed. And 200,000 uh, become refugees, meaning that 200,000 Hungarian people leave Hungary um, in order to try and uh, take refuge in another country. Similar to what's going on with um, Syria and Yemen now with this country, how, and on, I suppose Hong Kong soon, um, is that they are fleeing their place of um, terror to go and seek um help elsewhere. There is then another, I suppose, two, um, yeah, there are another two um, consequences. The West are in a little bit of an awkward position in that they can't really help the Hungarians with military um, forces because that will start World War Three. They are able to do one thing, which is really no help to the Hungarians, is that they condemn the actions. Meaning they say, bad USSR, bad boy. Um, and they, they say to them that they are bad. They also raise, in fundraisers from the public, a total of $6 million of aid. But they can't provide any military. The last words on the radio to, uh, of the Hungarians is help, help. Um, and they, they do condemn them, but they can't do anything other than that because it would start another war. The final consequence... Here we go is the Soviet uh, see this as a victory because they maintain their empire they are able to keep all their satellite states in check they don't lose Hungary they keep Hungary all the other satellite states then know what the consequence will be if they uh, disobey the Soviet Union and they are able to reassert their authority by saying right you put a foot out of line this is what happens okay and it it's a real a real sucker punch for the satellite states because they thought oh maybe maybe this is the beginning of change and it really isn't what I'd like you to do then please is I've given you a um, little word document you are going to recap using either my story in terms of what I did at the beginning the very brief version or Monday's um, live and you are going to go over um, the recap of the invasion and the uprising I've then got on page two consequences of the uprising and obviously my consequences of here I want to know about what the Western powers did. I want to know about um, 
what did the brutal response show to the um, other satellite states and a bit uh, just basically some consequences about what happened it's really important that you do this work as it won't make sense on friday when we do our live lesson of going over a narrative account hopefully that helps i am in school today but um if you need anything i will be uh, i do have a break um, so I will be able to give you a bit of a hand during that time, but I am teaching in the morning. But otherwise, give me a shout if you need anything. Hopefully it's straightforward enough for you. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.